people here. This is great. Everyone. <laughs> okay, yeah. I'm, I just clicked record, so it's recording now. Perfect. Um, so for everybody, if, uh, if you're not talking, um, make sure that you're on mute. This is, so this is our first time doing a house hacking, um, house hacking meetup. This was an, an idea that came up uh, between Andres and I um, because we wanted to just, with everybody being like stuck at home, uh, we wanted to figure out why, why not uh, be able to connect with other like-minded people, people that want to invest in real estate, that want to house hack, just connect and um, share a little bit about what house hacking is all about and also answer people's questions. People can share their wins. Just, just create a call just, just for fun um, that uh, we can help out. And we also have uh, Felipe Mejia here on the call, which is- Hey, what's up everyone? He's the man of the moment. What nah, is up, bro. my guy? <laughs> what up, y'all? What y'all doing? All good, all good here good. in Austin. Oh, yeah, dang. so for for everybody here, Felipe and I, we run a mastermind group called Rat Race to FI, which is right behind me over here. And uh, the goal is to help other people be able to buy their first rental. We walk them through through the whole process, uh, whether it is their first house hack. Um, but the whole goal is to help people become financial independent, have accountability, and have a community. So that is That's right. That is the goal. Um, and uh, for people here, we are, we are, I'm still admitting people in. Um, but what I wanted to, to do for, for the call uh, is just in, introduce myself um, and also Andres, because Andres, he is now a house hacker as of today. He just bought his first property uh, ever. Uh, uh, he's no, also, yeah, he's <laughs> also part you. of the mastermind group. Uh, which is which is great, and uh, he'll tell you a little bit more about the deal, so that 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 deal is going to be our analysis of the day, and um, and from there I'm going to see if I can. But um, from from there we'll just continue ask questions, talk about potential topics, and go from there. Um, so it's eight o'clock, eight o two, so we'll get started. The, um, a, little, a little bit about me. My name is Diego. I'm uh, 29 years old, living in Austin, Texas. Bought my first house hack when I was 24 years old. Uh, bought a single family home, lived with three roommates. And ever since then, I was, I've been living for free. Bought it, putting 5% down with a... Um, with a <laughs> one second. Um, bought it with a conventional loan. And the rent payment covered all of my monthly expenses uh, and also my car payment. So ever since then, I've been living for free. And now I've been helping other people start house hacking. And now my portfolio consists of three properties here in Austin, uh, like 10 properties in Tennessee, one that I own with Felipe. And uh, I own a quadplex and a duplex in Florida. Uh, but it all started with house hacking, and since the next six years, I've been I've been evolving and uh, and investing. So, so yeah, that's that's a bit about me. Um, I'm gonna introduce Andres here so that he can introduce himself. And uh, oh, and I am a realtor full time in Austin, Texas. So uh, Felipe and I are both. Re I mean, Andres and I are both realtors. So if you guys have any questions pertaining to that. We can uh, we can help too. So Andres, introduce yourself, please. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, um, for everyone, for coming. I'm very excited to share this knowledge that I've been I've been learning. Like Diego said, I just bought my first home, and I am extremely excited. So I wanted to touch a little base on the house hacking topic. I bought my first home when under contract on the 12th of February, and I just got the home today. So essentially, what um, what I had in mind was to cut my largest expense, which was rent. And I was thinking of ways that I can do that. So uh, the topic house, house hacking came into, into play, which is when you buy your home and you, you want to have four or three rooms and you rent out the other rooms so that your roommates are essentially covering your mortgage. 
which is the rent that the bank finances for you. So I put 10% down of the purchase price and I was able to purchase a four bedroom home, three and a half bathrooms. My mortgage is going to be 1,850 and my three roommates will be paying 2,150. So that's a cash flow of 300 and I'm living for free. And the great thing about that is that, I mean, anyone can do this as a primary resident, you can put 3% down and also you can co-borrow with your parents, which is great. In case you don't have that money, you can always co-borrow with your parents and you're building equity, which is very important. So that's something I did. And I mean, right now I'm loving it. My, my roommate is my brother and two other friends. So that's going to be awesome. I'm, I'm extremely excited about that. And also the, the other thing um, that's really cool too is, and of course with house hacking, at the end of the day, you can buy a duplex, triplex or quadplex with an FHA loan, three and a half. You live on one side while you rent out the others. And, or the other thing is buying a house and living with roommates while you live in, in, in the master. So, um, so those are the examples of house hacking. But the cool thing that, that Andres did is he was able to, um, he was able to buy a home from a builder and the builder, because he went with their lender, the builder paid all of his closing costs. So that's another strategy um, if, um, for, for people that are wanting to buy a house, you can go to, to the builder. This time it was DR Horton, but there's builders like KB Home, Lennar. And if you go with their lender, um, they will pay 5,000, 6,000 or 3,000 of your closing costs. And that's literally free money from, from that perspective. Um, and of course you can still get other quotes from other lenders and then have them match it or fight for it. And whoever gives you the best deal is going to be the one that, um, that you can go with. But at the end of the day, the goal is to get into a property if it works for you with as little money down um, as possible so that you can get as much cash on cash return. So that's, that's the idea. Um, but right, right now, I just wanted to open it up and see uh, you guys can put any particular um, house, hacking, house hacking questions uh, in, on the chat. This is our first time ever doing this, and we have like 50, we have like sixty people. So it's gonna be interesting how how this goes. But is there a specific topic or something that you guys want to share? I will be happy um, to bring other people here to 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 talk. Feel free to unmute yourself, and uh, we can go from there. Diego, Anna has a question. She's saying she's asking about the HOA and rent by the room. Are there any issues with that? From your experience, have you had any issues with that? With HOAs, it's easier if it's a house or a townhome rather than a small condo. But at the end of the day, so I, when I reach out to roommates and when, when I try to look for, for my roommates, I do it through Craigslist or online on, on like on a group on Facebook. So that allows me like the address is not out there on, on Zillow or, or any, any other place where people can actually find out if you're renting by the room. It has happened to one of my clients actually recently in all the years. Uh, but it's because he was putting, putting on Zillow the whole address and saying that he was renting by the room. So that would be the only, the only issue. Um, if you do it without, if, if you do it like on the download, you shouldn't have any, any problems. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it's, it's a lot about, um, what your goal is, what's your goal. So do you want to live for free? Do you want to make a cash flow? And you, you make sure that your numbers make sense. So it's very important to know how much you can rent per room, either through Craigslist, through a real estate agent and seeing what the comparables are and seeing if your property matches up with that house. So you can have a, a house maybe in this neighborhood, but then this other house is a three bedroom, three bathroom and yours is a two bedroom, two bathroom. So you have to take everything into account, make sure that the comparables are comparable with your own home. And then from there, you're like, okay, I want to make a cash flow. How much do I have to put down as well as something that you 
have to look at. And that's why talking to, talking with a lender, because there's a lot of costs that you have to take into account from there. Yeah, for sure. Um, some people are asking, is it worth a house hack if there's no cash flow? And one of the great things uh, about house hacking is that it all depends on your goals. It all depends. Um, it all really depends what what your strategy is in the next couple of years. And the reason why is that, <clears throat> let me give you an example. If you're living in, an, in a one bedroom apartment where the rent is 1500 bucks a month, but then you're able to house hack a property, put some money down, and then out of your pocket, maybe it's a duplex and you're living on one side and renting out the other and out of your pocket, now you're paying 900 bucks or a thousand bucks even though you're literally not right now, you're not cash flowing. You have to see it from the perspective that in the future, uh, well, you see it from the perspective that if you were to stay in your apartment, you will be paying fifteen hundred. Now you're paying a thousand out of your pocket, so you're saving five hundred a month, which is six thousand dollars a year. So you have to see it that way. And then one other thing for me, my my uh, goal is cash flow and that passive income. But there's another great thing about house hacking that there's a bonus appreciation. So long run, your property more likely than not will appreciate here in the Austin market in the past 10 years, it's been insane appreciation. So right now it's cash flow, but then there's that bonus of appreciation, which your property value goes up after five, 10 years, even less, maybe depending on what market you're in. Yeah. There is a question here. Um, so yeah, so, so that, that really depends on, on your cash flow because sometimes even if you don't have the cash flow going into your pocket, you also get to depreciate the property and, and you have the appreciation. And one of the best parts too is the tax deductions. So the property taxes is a tax deduction and then um, the, the interest and the PMI. So when you take that into consideration, if you're making $100,000 a year at your job and you're able to tax deduct $10,000 because of taxes, interest, PMI, now you're paying taxes on $90,000 um, instead of $100,000. So those are some things to consider too. Um, Felipe, I know you're, you're on the call. Did I miss anything or anything you want to add? And if you're on mute, that's fine. But um he's hiding <laughs> yeah what um See, does, well, there was does, a question i know this is more for a lender but how does yeah. co-borrowing work can we talk a little about that so co-borrowing on the so co-borrowing is basically where you are you you get on a loan with somebody else and yeah. whether it is a friend it can be it can be your partner, it can be a parent, but you're both of you guys are going to go on the loan. And some people do this because they might not have all of the cash. Other people do this be so that their debt to income ratio um, is higher. And at the end of the day, it's just, just a way so that two or more people can, can buy a property. They can get into, into a home. Yeah, okay, great. There was another question about income. How much does your income have to be to buy a home? And that depends on, I mean, it's more about talking with your lender. So you get in contact with a lender and they'd have to check some, some surface level questions, which is a, a pre-qualification and then a pre-approval is deeper questions like a debt to income and whatnot. But it's more about talking with your lender and seeing how much you're making from then they'll tell you how much you can afford for a home. Yeah. And guys, um, <clears throat> I don't know how many here, if you can put on the chat um, or um, how many people already own properties. Uh, I don't know if you can do a poll here because it, it will be pre yeah. pretty cool to see how many people own properties and how many don't. <clears throat> and the, the reason why is because it's super important to know that <clears throat> the first step in buying a property and starting house hacking is definitely figure out who your team is. And your team should consist of your investor-friendly realtor, your lender, and then of course your, your, your inspector or any other people. But the main two 
are going to be your investor-friendly realtor and your lender. Um, after you do that, then that's when you go into the buying process. Mm -hmm. And after that, the appraiser is going to get called, the, the, the inspector, and 30, 30 days around there later, that's when you're going to get your keys and you close up your home. Uh, but it's super important to be able to have the right team in place so that you're working with somebody that either knows already about house hacking or they can put you in the right direction with their resources. Yeah. And the, also the great thing about house hacking. So um, your home will be known as your primary residence. You're in the home for a year and you can put 3% down. So that's, that's insane. As an investment property, you have to put a minimum of 20% down. But for your first home, you can put 3% and thereafter you can put 5%. So it's, it's definitely great putting that 3% and then never having to pay rent again and having your mortgage uh, being paid off by your roommates if you're smart about how you find your roommates. Yeah. yeah. There was one question here that's really nice. That it's, it's a good question. Um, it's, it, it was asking, how do you calculate the, the rent for, for the room? or the security deposit for security deposit i usually do one month's rent or five five hundred bucks depending if it's a room or the side of of a duplex or of a multifamily. but by but the way that i find um the way that i find my tenants um i mean the the rent let me see i'm gonna i'm gonna share my my um uh, I'm going to share our Instagrams as well in case we have some some questions that we can't answer. Yeah, I'm going to share my screen here. Um, I'm going to show you how I can do this. Um, so if you guys can see, do you guys see my screen? Yeah. Yes. Okay, sweet. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to show you how I find the rooms by the rent. Um, so I go to austin.craigslist.com. Then I go to rooms and shares, sorry. So Craigslist, I'm gonna go to rooms and shares. And then from here, I go to the map. Let me see, list, I go to the map. So right here, I can see all of the rooms that are, that are available in the area. So for example, um, let's see, so this is in North Austin. So here we can see there is this one over here for four fifty four four ninety five comfy cozy. This is a street parking. Let me see if there's pictures. But basically, what I do is I just look at all of these various areas, and uh, and then I see what what is available and what they're going for. So for example, here this is six hundred female roommate at Harris Ridge Home. So you can see that this one is in this, in this particular area. Um, but let me go back here. You can also ask your investor friendly realtor to yeah. um, pull up the MLS, which is what we use to mm -hmm. see the comparables in the area. Yeah. So you have like 500 here, you have uh, 850, 700, depending on the, depending on the situation uh, and on the description, you can tell that, for example, here there's 700. This one is 695. This one is a thousand, but this is like luxury, a spacious master. So this gives you ideas of what you might be able to rent the the rooms for. This is 675. So just just to give you ideas about how I do it. But then of course, if you have um, if you have a side like a duplex, you can always just use rental meter as an application. Um, but I, I use Craigslist because I do it by the rooms. Yeah. Um, let's see, Sebastian from Austin. Yeah, What's up, Sebastian? We have, um, what is the cash on cash return percentages that you guys like to work? Um, on cash on cash returns, it's, it's important. So, if you're going to be renting by the room, sometimes there is more, there's a bit more cash flow, but it all depends on the property because the ideal property to house hack is going to be a four bedroom home. Um, 
with two and a half bathrooms. That way you can have three roommates and be able to maximize it. If you guys want to have a little bit more of uh, more more space, at least you can rent out to two roommates and have one bedroom as a study or as a guest, whatever. But it does give you the, the, the ability to maximize the income and the cash on cash return really depends on your on what your down payment is but because house hacking you have to keep into consideration that you're going to be saving your rent payment too that way you don't have to pay it somewhere else you have to take all of that into account uh but i think that paolo just raised his hand uh do you want to unmute yourself and ask a question actually i do hey how you guys doing tonight doing well doing well right. okay glad you guys can hear me so i guess i'll break the ice on this question with the tightening of lenders um with uh you know you know your credit score and and what have you how are you guys looking at properties what's your best um advice on you know within that kind of situation since you know lenders are tightening up chase i'm guessing Wells Fargo, I just thought I just read something about Wells Fargo and some and other lend, you know, traditional lenders are probably going to come down the pike and whatnot. And are you looking at, and my second thing is, are you also guys looking at creative strategies in terms of uh, maybe acquiring properties, whether it be subject to or seller financing? Yeah, cool. That is, those are good, good questions. Um, re in relating to the whole uh, being able to finance, Right now, as things are beginning to tighten up a bit, um, as of right now, and of course, things might change in 60 days or, or whatever, but the big banks are the ones that are tightening, tightening up their guidelines. Right. Um, there's other, the, the banks that we use more like UFCU, like a credit union, or mm -hmm. people that are more of the... Um, that are, that are not related to the big banks, more those local. people are going to be more, more flexible and their guidelines are not going to be as tight. For, okay. for, but it's interesting that, so to, to give you an example, I'm a DACA recipient and mm -hmm. Chase will not, will not give me a loan because of my DACA status, mm -hmm. but I have two loans with them because they buy my loan later. So even though they may uh, tighten up the guidelines, right. Um, right, they can go with, and you can go with another lender and then Chase is going to buy that loan later. It's just that they're just doing those guidelines, um, I think, just to make sure that, that they're getting well-qualified buyers, of course, but the opportunities are still out there um, to get an FHA loan with, I think... Um, you need a 580 or 600. And then of course, a conventional loan is 620. If right. the guidelines tighten up a bit for credit, um, I mean, at the end of the day, yeah. try to work on your credit, right? Right, um, right, right, right. So, right. yeah. Um, and then your, your other question was in relating to getting creative. I mm -hmm. feel like it all depends on your, in the areas where you live. Of course, okay. there's owner financing, seller mm -hmm. financing. It's going to be interesting to see what happens to in the next, let's say, 60 days with right. the forbearance. Right. Um, but if you see a good deal right now, I would say definitely pull, pull your trigger on it. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Any other, anything that you would like to add or either Andres or um, you, Felipe? Yeah, man. I, uh, so everyone knows what I do. I, I house hack in Nashville. I got about 60 tenants. Um, basically what I do is I, I do what Diego and, and Andres, what Andres just started doing 10 X. So he'll buy his next one and his next one, and his next one. He'll just keep doing it. He'll cash flow five to a thousand per house and then be like me, have 10 of them and then keep going. Hopefully he does way better than I do. Um, I, I, like Diego said, um, you know, there's going to be a lot of no's out there, guys. A lot of people are going to tell you no. Chase told him no, but now they're buying his loans. Mm -hmm. So like, don't let a no stop you. Like keep going. Like just because one person tells you no, or somebody says this hoop or that, like just keep pushing forward and keep pushing to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next, where they run out of no's. No, because of this or no, because of that. Just keep pushing. Right. Yeah. I have a I have a rental property with Diego. 
maybe be doing one with Andres later. I don't know. Um, but, but basically just, just keep pushing because everyone's always going to tell you that everyone's first answer from the bank's always going to be like, no, sorry, because of this or that go fix that and come back and do it again and do it again, do it again. Diego's story is really, really great of how he like, you know, overcame those problems. So, uh, I think house hacking is the best way for anybody to start in real estate and then kind of just grow and expand from there. So I'll yeah. challenge all you guys to do it. One now, thing that's um, great as well from, from, uh, for house hacking is that a lot of people that pay out of state tuition, if they have a primary residence in whatever state they're in, they can pay in state tuition through that. So for any of the students that are on right now, that's, um, something of great value that a lot of UT students that I've met, well, not a lot, but some have been doing, so that's also something to keep in mind. You get a property for maybe three years, four years in university, sell it, or you keep it and have a cash flow. Yeah. Now, um, I had received an email from Anna Coelho, uh, and she, she mentioned that one of the topics that she wanted to cover was once you buy your first property, how do you get your second one? So let me give you an example. Um, Andres, he just bought his first property where like April or May of 2020, um, he bought it putting 10, 10% down and in a year he's going to be able to get another owner occupant loan, whether it is an FHA loan, if he wants to get into a duplex, triplex or quadplex, or also get into a, or use a conventional loan, um, putting three to 5% down for his second home. But the key thing is he has to move out of his first one and move into his second one if he wants to put low down payment again. So that is the key. Now, what you do is you have a few choices to do with property number one. You can either have all your roommates move with you to the property number two and rent out property number one to a whole family. Let's say if it's a single family house, um, and then you use that lease that you have to qualify to buy the second, the second house. The other thing is you can put somebody in the master and then you still have to show the lender a lease. Then you can ask all of your roommates, be like, Hey guys, this is, I'm not going to emphasize this, this lease, but just, um, sign here. We will send this to the lender. Um, with with the amounts that you're making from that property and then use that to qualify for your second home and then you move into your second house and that's how that's what you can do up to I believe it's easy to do it up to four properties then there's other ways to get creative with the lenders to get it to 10 but that's the max right now you can do this 10 times the own the other thing too is that you can do this every year but you do not pay taxes on a property if you sell it, but you have to live there for two years. So that's up to you, depending on your game plan, um, when you want to, um, how long you want to live in the property, if you're doing it more that you don't want to pay taxes or, um, or you're just investing for the long term. So it doesn't really matter if you pay taxes, if you sell the property in three years or not, uh, and then just keep, keep with that cash flow. So that's that's what i would say there are a couple of uh questions here if i know agents in various areas i do there's one that i know in orlando eric miele so i can introduce you to that one and in houston i also know of an agent there so I'm sorry, Diego. this is anna thank hey, you anna. so much for responding to my question but yeah. um i just want to clarify so that the lease the year lease would be to show lenders on the new property on the on property number one because the lender needs to confirm that you can afford both properties right so yeah. they need to be able to have a, a lease on property number one so that you can afford property number two diego you also know a real estate agent in nashville <laughs> what the f bro? yes Where is that? nobody one? has asked that question yet people okay. are asking here first of all diego uh, marty wants to ask a question marty do yeah. you want to mute yourself so guys, if you guys do want to buy in Nashville, Felipe and his wife are realtors. They are awesome investor friendly. Shout out to Felipe. Yeah. My guy, Felipe. Yeah. Ya tu sabe, chico. Ya tu Andres, sabe. I have to give you uh, a shirt for the house hacking. Oh yeah, I know. What's up, man? I now now that you bought your property. Diego, Dallas up and coming, man. <laughs> Dallas. Yeah. There we go. 
Let's get right. Who had the Marty, question? Marty wanted to ask a question. Let's let Marty ask a question. Marty, can you hear us? Can you unmute so, yourself, please? Did he answer, or is he is he talking? No, he's not talking. Okay, so let's. If anybody let's wants to talk listen. to make it easier, um, raise okay, your Marty, hand Marty's on there. the on the. Um, on the chat here and we can bring you on that way we make it easy and people can also communicate it it can be a one way i mean a two two way conversation um uh, he's on i am on now so so when you said marty i thought you were my name is misael actually but ah, okay okay sorry what's up, yeah, it's in your marty. <laughs> i had no idea you were referring to me sorry <laughs> got okay you. so Question, I'm in the middle of uh, negotiating a fourplex here in, in Oklahoma City. It would be an off-market deal. And uh, the price that uh, the buyer is asking for, I think it's, uh, it's a fair, fair value. Um, I'm, I've been doing some cash flow analysis and I'm using a 15% reserves. So 5% for vacancy, 5% for CapEx and 5% for maintenance. And the, the the prop, you know, with those reserves, my cash flow is about ten dollars a month, uh, and that's with me paying paying rent as if I was a a, a tenant. Um, I'm trying to hopefully, you know, lower that price so that I can, you know, uh, at least save a little bit. Uh, of course, here the difference is that I would be paying rent to myself, and you know, if if I was not to put any any reserves, then I would be cash flowing. I would be living it for free and cash flowing about a a hundred dollars a month. So the question is, how do you go about a multifamily, you know, let's say a three place or four place in which in most cases you will have to, to put reserves if you, you know, you used to be safe, especially in, in, in this time when, you know, you don't know what's going, going to happen. I think the smart way would be to, to put reserves. Um, will you go with a, a, a deal that perhaps doesn't cash flow, but at least you're building equity. And again, a, a year from today, perhaps I can move on to another property and and bring in a a real tenant mm -hmm. and have him pay. If how much money? Out. How much money are you putting down again? It would be five percent with the FHA. Okay, okay. Um, so that is what what you're sharing is a really good question, and the reason why is because a lot of people don't invest or they would say, Hey, no, I, I don't want to do it because I'm only cash flowing like 10 bucks and that's with me paying the rent and all this other stuff. But what you have to consider is that because it's an FHA loan or a conventional loan, whatever it is under 20%, you're paying the PMI, right? So mm -hmm. that is because you're putting less than 20%. But once you have equity in the property and you can remove the PMI, then now you're, and you're still living in the property, let's say, maybe now you're making an extra $100, $200 because that PMI is off the table. So a lot of people don't think long-term enough, like two or three years down the road. And you're also, a lot of people begin to compare that what other investors are doing. But if you're going to be an investor, investors usually need 20% or 25% down you're doing this with 5% or 3%. So you have to keep that into consideration when you're running your numbers and know right. that of course, even though you are paying rent, like if you were living there, right, you're paying your yourself. I still feel that you're still able to depreciate the other sides. You're still able to um, get the tax deduction of the tax breaks that you get from being a homeowner and you get appreciation and you get the, like you're paying down on your mortgage. So there's other things that even though it doesn't sound sexy that you're, that you're making a lot of cash flow, right? Because at the end of the day, you're not on paper, you're seeing your debt go down. You're, you're seeing equity and that's what it's all about too. And like Diego said, it's, it's all about what your end goal is. I mean, is it building equity? Is it cash flowing at this from the start? Because like you said, if your market's a great market, then your property appreciates. And once you leave, you're getting that cash flow because you're not living there anymore and you can get another primary residence. 
So it depends all what your end goals are, you know? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's definitely in a, in a good area, very hot area. Um, perhaps not right now since all the bars, bars and restaurants are closed down, but it's yeah. in, a, in a good area. I, I, I have the, 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 the financials, uh, you know, I, I've received everything from the, from the owner. Again, it will be an off market deal. Uh, and just a follow up question right quick. Diego, you didn't mention that you can still, even, even if you're house hacking, you can still expense the depreciation, right? I believe so. Yeah. 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 Um, and if you guys need a connection with a CPA, uh, there's one that's in our mastermind group. She is awesome. Her name is Anna Klein. Uh, she is based out of Milwaukee, I think, or, or up North, but, um, she, she, she's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, Anna Klein, I'm going to be, she's my CPA as well. So she's great. <laughs> yeah. 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 And one, one thing that um, someone was talking about the 1031 exchange and the 1031 exchange is essentially what you're doing is you are getting another property that's of equal or higher value than your property and you're deferring the taxes. So there's, there's a lot that goes into it, but uh, in short, it's uh, when you purchase a property that's of equal or higher value and you're differing all of your taxes with that property bet bet you have to pay your taxes once the the property that you got from the 1031 exchange once you sell that if you don't sell it you don't have to pay the taxes on that the capital gains yeah that is and correct oscar was uh you oscar was saying it was talking about the fha so fha has on MIP mortgage insurance premium that you have to pay for the life of the loan. It's an amount that you have to pay monthly and then a uh, conventional conventional loan, anything below 20%, you have to pay something known as a PMI private mortgage insurance. So if you get that 3%, you're going to have to be a uh, pay a PMI, but it's not much honestly for a 3%. If, if your numbers make sense, that makes sense. I'm paying a PMI of $41 on on my on my house with a 10 percent down so yeah. it's not a huge amount you know yeah that's awesome there is one question here about um that that i think has been asked a few times if i have my primary residence and buy another house i can my wife claim one as a primary and do the other as primary if we're still married so that is a really good question um the lender will be the one that will tell you yes, for sure. But from my understanding is um, it gets tricky when you're married because even though the loan is in your name, the house is still on both of you guys' name. At least it, it, it all depends on, on your state. So, um, so that's one thing that you have to, that's why I said it's really tricky because it depends on, on your state. I feel, um, but you guys can definitely do the, um, put the loan on your name. If, for example, if she doesn't have a high enough credit or vice versa, if, let's say she has a credit and you don't, um, you put it all in her name. And then once you fix yours, you can put yours on another name. Uh, I, I mean, on your name and get that loan that way. But I feel like both of you will still be on the title for, for every property that you buy. So keep that in consideration. I know that, uh, that uh, Sven asked that and also Fatima. So, yeah. Great. And we what have some people plan? here that are in the mastermind. We have Julio who's looking at, uh, at his, uh, his properties, duplex or mm -hmm. single Kevin, family. Oh, Kevin just got his property. What's up my guy? We have Kevin, we have Sven on the call too. So this is good for, for, for you guys. If you guys do want to, um, want to learn more about the mastermind group that Felipe and I have, um, we are opening up spots. Um, it's called Rad Race. I'm going to put it here. Rad yeah, Race to fi.com slash mastermind. You guys will be able to check out what, what, what it's all about. And at the end of the day, like I was sharing earlier, it's all about community, accountability, and, uh, and we get into calls like this um, too, and we bring speakers, like people that are doing wholesaling, people that are building different businesses, um, people that are investing in Detroit, all over flipping, all, all, all of that stuff.
Yeah, it's so, been great. I'm a part of it and I love it. It's, yeah. it's awesome, guys. Um, right. let's, let's see. Any other question? Samuel yeah. wants to ask, ask a question. Samuel, let's do this. Hopefully you guys are finding this helpful, by the way, because this is, again, this is the first time I ever do this with so many people. Yeah. On a call. So, <laughs> yeah. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I was the one who asked the question about the, my wife and I own a house and I want a house hack. Um, and I will be getting the loan mm -hmm. on a different city, which would be around the Austin area. I was talking to Andres uh, about the Hutto area. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to look into getting a loan. Uh, I just didn't know how hard it would be um, for me to get the loan. And, you know, as my primary, since I would be staying one or two days in that area and then driving back the other days back home to see my wife and kids. Yeah, I, w I was on that call too with, yeah. with Andres. I was chatting yeah. with you. Yeah, cool. Small world. You live in San Antonio. Uh, New, New Braunfels. New Braunfels. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. I remember that. Awesome. Well, well, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, um, and what's unique too is that depending on the distance, um, that's something that you have to share with the lender because sometimes the distance that does, does change things a little bit, which is, which in your end will be a good thing. Okay. All yeah. right. Well, thank you. No yeah. problem, Samuel. Diego, one question we have here that we've been getting is about renters and uh, Dylan had asked a question about how do you get over living with someone that you don't know. So it starts off very much with what your contract is before you even get a roommate, you have to have strict guidelines as to um, what your credit score is going to be, you know, and all that. So it's very important to have those guidelines in and uh, Diego, if you want to share a little about, about your experiences and how, how you screen tenants to make sure that um, they, they fit those guidelines. Yeah, for sure. So as there are various, there are various steps, right? That, um, that one does when, when you're having your tenants, whether it is a roommate or whether it is somebody that's going to live on, on one of the sides of, of your house hack. But the main thing is doing a background check and there's, there's applications like, Cozy um, home. like resident research. There's Cozy.co and Cozy.co allows you to also do the management, which is great. Um, so what, what you can do is use Cozy.co to run the criminal background check, run their, run their credit. They can apply also through that website. Um, so that's part one. The other thing is you want to ask them to, to like, especially if they're going to be roommates, you want to make sure that, that your lifestyle is the same, right? If, uh, if they like to play music in, in the room or they have drums and they're looking to play their drums, then that might not be a good, good fit of, of a roommate. Um, but you want to make sure that you do a background check you, and at, at that point, it'll be up to you to see how lenient you want to be, right? If somebody got caught with weed or a DUI five years ago, 10, 10 years ago, that'll be up, up to you. Um, but credit score, uh, I feel like it's more important if they're renting a side rather than a room. Yeah. Um, but you want to make sure that, that you ask them the right questions and that you also do a job verification. You get their pay stubs and then you call their employer uh, or their human resource or their manager, whatever. And you basically ask them um, if they're in good standing, do you think that they will still be at, the, at their job within the next 90 days? Um, how long have they been working there? And also how much do they get paid? Because you want to make sure that you verify um, cause they might lie on their application. They get paid. Oh, I get paid like $50,000 and they really get paid $30,000 a year. That's why you get their, their pay stubs. And also you verify with their employer. Um, you can also do, um, you can also do, you can call their previous landlord. Yeah, so that, that was you, very important. you can ask them, um, have they paid late? How many times have they paid late? How much are they paying? Uh, will you rent to them again? Um, and yeah, those are all really, really good, really good questions that I feel will definitely help you get 
quality quality tenants. And then at the end of the day, getting a five hundred dollar security deposit at least if they're renting a room or uh, one month's rent if they're renting a site. Those yeah. are typ- typical things. And if you are less lenient on people telling you, hey, is it okay if I pay you the security deposit in three different, like in three months, that's a red flag because I want tenants that do have a little bit of cash um, or that are willing to pay the full security deposit because this means that if they cannot come up with a security deposit, if they have, uh, if a tire goes flat or something happens to their car, now you're not going to get paid rent. So, um, so that, that gives you the flexibility to get good, good tenants, making sure that you ask them those quality questions. Um, I have a list of those questions too. So, um, I'll be more than happy to, to share those things. Um, Hey Diego, can I, can I ask a quick question? Yeah, Bishoy. Sure. What's up, Bishoy? Nice <laughs> to see you here. <laughs> nice to see you, man. It's been a while. <laughs> uh, quick question. So how did you find more success uh, when buying properties like closer to schools? Or how do you go about like picking the right location? And have you seen like more success? Have you seen like issues where you're not finding tenants for the houses in particular locations? Yeah. Or- so... Um, be sure you and I are a perfect example, right? Because we moved, we, we went to school together at, at FSU. We moved to Austin in 20, 2013, 2013. <laughs> in 2013, but what, what happened, right? So at that point I saw that General Motors was hiring freaking like 300 people a quarter that were college new hires More and they were all. Bit. And we were near Dell, we were near Apple, we're near Samsung. Right. So I began to see uh, a common theme that there's other millennials, there's other young people moving into this area. So that's why I picked the areas that I bought because I knew that there's going to be a lot of um, a lot of people that, that that were coming in. And now a lot of the roommates that I've had in the past have worked at Apple, at Samsung, at Dell, at General Motors. So it, it has shown that the strategy that I used has worked, but you can apply this to various different areas, right? I know that Oracle down in South Austin, and I'm just giving examples of the area that I know because that's what's happening, is in South Austin, there's other companies and, uh, and you just have to do the right research. Then of course, if there's universities um, near the area, then you know that more than likely you're gonna have students living there, whether they're undergrad or graduate, um, then, you can, then you know that those will be your target audience. Mm-hmm. And then if you live near a hospital, near schools or near, yeah, um, at that point you can target, um, people that are working at the hospitals, for example. So it, it really depends on, it really depends on, on your strategy, but you should know um, who your target audience is going to be. For me, to, to give you an example, I knew um, that most of, my, most of my tenants might be in tech just because of the fact that there's so many tech agencies, companies, and all of that stuff in the area that I was buying. Right. So, I, because the reason I'm asking, I have an opportunity for a house. Uh, it's about five miles away from a, a university here, uh, U, UT Arlington. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it's, uh, I just don't know if it's far enough, close enough. There is, you know, I just wanted to see if you had any success with uh, being too close to a school or mm-hmm. you, you're targeting, like when you're picking the house, do you actually, uh, do you actually maybe advertise for it? before you you start the process do you have you done that before yes i have done it before and um i start so but the key thing is they cannot legally they cannot sign a lease until you are the owner so what i did with one of my properties is i started to find roommates on craigslist and i showed them the property before i bought it and then the weekend that I moved into the house after that Friday that I bought the property, that's when I had my tenants sign a lease and they started to move into the home. 
So that is, that's, that's what I did. But for you, I mean, if you're close to the, to the university, do you want to live with potential students or no? I'm, I'll be okay for like a year or a little yeah. bit less of a year. So, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, I feel like you, you're, you're definitely in, you're mm -hmm. definitely doing the, the right strategy in making sure that, that, um, like sort of, um, you know, that your target audience more than likely are going to be students and students are mm -hmm. always going to rent. So I feel like you are, you're in good shape there. Uh, one, one last question. So, um, when I talked to a lender and I kind of explained to him what I'm planning to do. And he said, the, the income that you're getting from the other rooms that you're renting won't be considered like a cash flow or an income if you want to use it towards getting a new house, like later on, only if you execute a lease for the entire house. Is that the situation that you guys having to, or do you work with other lenders that Technically, yes. So there is, so it's interesting, right? Because you are not, because of the fact that you're not cash flowing, let's say, um, you, the renters, the, the, the people are not going to use, if you're renting to, to roommates, the lenders are not going to use the income that, you, that you're making from your house because technically you are living there. So they're not going to count that as, as income where they do count it is once you move out, you can execute a lease and tell them, Hey, after I move out, I'm going to be making X amount of money um, from it. And you can add those tenants on that lease, but it will be, they can use the money after you move out. And with any property, the lender uses 75% of that. So Keep that in mind. This is with any property. So is it, it's going to be one lease for all the tenants when you move one out? Lease, yes, one lease for all the tenants. So what I do is I tell them, um, and usually I have a good relationship with them. So I'm like, hey guys, I'm about to buy another property. Hmm. I'm not going to enforce this lease. I just need everybody to sign. And when I'm, I'm, I just add everybody's, everybody's room thing in there. Mm -hmm. And they're like, okay, cool. And I get qualified. But how do you manage this when you when each one had came came in different times and they have their own s separate leases? So yeah, I mean at that point that's when you get creative, right? So okay. you just tell them I'm gonna be creating this lease. I'm not enforcing it. It's just for a week. Like at the end of the day, that's what you're gonna have to do if yeah. you're if you're gonna be living oh, by. I see you're saying. Okay. Be doing yeah, it yeah. By by the room. Okay, I don't want to take all the time, but we're going to talk of, uh, offline later. Yeah. <laughs> but these are good questions, right? Because at the end of the day, for people that are renting by the room, mm -hmm. um, you need to make sure that you're putting yourself in a position where, I mean, like, if, if your roommates are okay and you tell them, I am not enforcing this lease, I just need it for the future, um, right. just for a month. Um, I know people that have, so I have helped people in Austin here buy like up to their third property and we do exactly the same thing over and over again and it works because the lender only need to see an executed lease and that's it like you don't really yeah it. yeah and because you're you're gonna be putting the money that's coming in you're gonna be after the first property you put it into a bank account whatever that is you have a track record of the income mm -hmm. um you you would be in good shape and this works the same way if you have a duplex or triplex you want to make sure that you have that you're taking account of of all of the rents that you're making but when so, you go to, to set up go ahead <laughs> it's still the same i'm really interested in this topic too so yeah. the new lease you make it for all the rooms you add up the tally of all the rooms even if you have some vacant um I mean, at that point, yes, that, that, that will be up to you because at the end of the day, you, can, you may have a room vacant, you may not have a room, but you want to do it where everybody, um, where it puts you in the best position with the lender. But w when, when the lender looks at your bank statements and you, he sees the, the lease, the, the, the rent coming in uh, like separately, like uh, 500 here, 500 from here, mm -hmm. um, is that does that cause an issue later on or um not really if you can support it 
if you can support it, I feel like you will be in good shape. Um, one of the ways that I've been able to go around that some, sometimes has been um, if they Venmo me the money. Mm-hmm. Um, Doesn't show. If they Venmo me the money, I just put the whole amount into my bank account. Um, and then if they really need proof, I'm like, hey, these are the tenants that are on the lease. This is what they're paying me. So if they really need like all the extra proof of how I got that money and, and so forth. Um, Diego, we have two questions. Yeah. So one of them was uh, from Fatima. What documents do you ask for application besides pay stubs and last living space? Living space. So there's, there's um, some places like Cozy.co, like Diego had mentioned, that they do their background check. And like we said, pay stubs, last living situa- less living space. So you want to call not the last one. You want to call the last one, but you also want to call the previous two if possible because the last one might be trying to get rid of that person. So they might say good stuff about them when in reality, that's not what, um, what uh, is, is correct. So you want to call the last two or three and then um, cozy.code is all of the screening. And then there was a question about the security deposit. That's mm-hmm. refundable as long as there's no uh, wear and tear. So if, say for example, a carpet is stained or something, you see how much that costs to repair that and you give them back after you've repaired it. So say for example, it costs a hundred to repair the carpet and you had a security deposit of 500, you give them back five, 400. Yeah. Then exactly. Chad, Chad had a question. Chad, could you, Diego, are you, can you read Chad's question? So is there a way to gauge in advance? But what do you mean by that, Chad? What, what possibilities are for tenants? What possibilities are for tenants? Obviously, that will change my comfort level. Hey, what's up, guys? Can hey, you Chad. hear me? Go Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, uh, appreciate you guys taking my question here. Um, I'm looking to purchase just my first home and obviously want to do it as a house hack if possible. Um, so the issue that I'm running into is um, I've been looking about five months or so and I've only seen one multifamily come across in my area. And so uh, also exploring the possibility of doing rent by the room. Um, but when I'm looking around just on Craigslist, Facebook, um, you know, on different websites that I've heard mentioned here and there, uh, rent by the room also seems to be basically non-existent in my area. It just doesn't really seem to be a thing that happens much. So obviously my comfort level on purchase prices is going to change based on whether I think I'm going to be able to get tenants or what the ease of that is going to be. So I was just curious if you guys had any suggestions for how to sort of gauge in advance what the interest was going to be from people in my area of doing something like that. Don't live in a huge city, live in a small East Texas town of 30 to 40,000. We do have a small community college here, so that's certainly um, one avenue that I could explore. But I just want to see if you guys had any suggestions there as to sort of reaching out in advance and saying, hey, what's the interest in this area for something like this? Um, Mm -hmm. Just so that I can sort of have a better idea of, do I need to be looking on the lower price end because I may only be able to find one roommate or on the higher end because I'm gonna be able to find two or three? Yeah. That is, that is definitely a good question. And I would say you should ask people around your area, like all of your friends, all of your coworkers, and just ask them, Hey, would you like, do you know anybody that might be looking for a room? Or one of the other things is find out how much your friends are paying for a one bedroom apartment, let's say, and ask them, hey, would you, would you live or do you know people that if one bedroom's apartments are a thousand bucks, it's like, hey, do you know people that will be willing to pay 500 for, for a room? I feel like just asking, asking questions over and over again, you will, you, you will be able to, to get some answers and see, and see if, that, if that will be an option for you. Chad, one thing I'd recommend get on a Facebook group for the community college, like a buy, sell, rent page. There has to be some for your community college and gauge it from there. Be like, hey guys, I am renting this. Well, you don't have it yet, but kind of see what the rents are going for. For example, here at UT Austin, there's plenty of pages that go like for buy, sell, rent. And from there, you can see the students that are wanting to rent at this price and that price. And then you want to try to be competitive or go a little lower. So that's a higher incentive for you. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Mm-hmm. No problem. For sure. I think uh, Joel has raised his hand. Joel, 
Uh, what the, is your question? The question is, what do I need to be doing right now with my tenants to be able to use my rent income as income to qualify for another multifamily? Okay, cool. So we, we, we went over that. Um, hey, um, we, yes, hello? We can send a recording. Yeah, what's up? Hey, sorry, Hi, how's it going? Oh, doing sorry. Well. What's up? What's up? Hi, so uh, I have uh, two, two th I have two properties, uh, four doors. Uh, so I want to know, I want to prepare myself to buy my next multifamily. Um, and I want to use my rent income and possibly the future rent income from the multi, for the multi, uh, units to be able to qualify for more. I live in San Diego. So, so the question, so you have okay so you have properties in other places no i have I, all my properties are here in san diego okay it's, it's two properties two okay. a duplex two duplex and uh a converted a uh, garage so i live in one of them and uh until now I've, I've only used my my own income but i haven't used the rent income so what should i be doing uh, to prepare myself for me to use that rent as income. Do I need to be saving anything? Do I need to report anything? Do anything special? So if you're going to start to report, so what, what are you doing with, with, with the income? Like, is it cash or like, yeah. A, huh? Yeah. Uh, half of it is cash, Venmo, Zelle. No. But do you report that in your taxes or something or not really? Not yet. Okay. So what you need to do, you need to start doing that. Um, so that because the banks more than likely are going to need to have a whole year's worth of those types of income. They need to be either on your, they need, they need to be on your tax return in order for them to use it. Okay. Technically, so that's, technically that's it. That, that's that, that yeah, that will be it. If you, um, you will speak with a lender to see if maybe they can use a lease um, to, to give you the ability to use future income to be like, okay, well, this lease was executed, whatever date, um, we'll, we'll know that the rent will get covered and we'll use 75% of that. Uh, but also keep in mind that as you guys are buying your next properties in the future, you guys will need um, your, um, you guys will definitely need the, um, six months of reserves for your first property or, or your future okay. properties. So that are on the investment side. So keep that in mind. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah for Thank sure. Mar Martinez had a question. Are you guys on? Uh, yeah, we're on. We're on. So we are two brothers that are currently, uh, a hacking we just started with the house that we live on. So we currently have three, uh, three rooms for rent. So we're making um, 1800 nice. and then we're paying off uh, 1100 for our mortgage. So our cash flow is 700. Um, a question that we both had was, when you guys do your contracts with the roommates, how do you guys go with the contract? How do you guys go about it when they sign it? Do they have to go get it notarized? And then is there a specific thing that you add on that contract? Yeah. Um, so as, as far as the contract goes, every if you want to do it the legit way, of course, you need to go with add whatever addendums it is required by your city or by your state. Um, because every state is completely different as, as in relation to like, what are the things that are needed in, in your contract? But I usually just use a, um, I'll show you here. Let me see if I can, yeah, let's, let's see if I can use my here. finder here. I, I want to show you guys a little bit about like, so as part of the mastermind that, that, that that I have with people that are buying their first rental and stuff like that, they get access to um, the employment verification questions that I was sharing earlier. I don't know if you guys can see that. Um, but one of the things that we have here is also the, the lease. Um, can you guys see the can lease that I'm sharing? Put it more to the right. Can yes. you put it more yeah. to the right? 
Yeah, there. C can you guys see this? Yeah. yeah. Right there. Okay, cool. So this is the lease that I technically use, but I, I have two other examples um, that I have literally like tenant expectations and house rules. Uh, this is in relation to like cleaning, households, um, inventory, keys, like attorney fees. And also uh, security like deposit and stuff like that. All of the stuff, I have it here. Um, so, and then here at the end is where uh, you sign and and uh, whoever's going to live in, in, in the room signs. So this is what I usually just send to all of my roommates and they sign like that. Um, there's no need to get it notarized or anything like that. Oh, okay. Awesome. Is that a template that you get somewhere or you just do it with yourself? Excuse me? Is that a template, the document? Is it a template that you got from somewhere else or have you written the whole thing on your own? This is a template that I found um, years that I found, man, back in like 2012. And then I started to make changes to it depending on the things that I found out as, as the years went by. Um, that's why I added the tenant expectations and house rules here too. Just, just, just because I wanted to like know about like smoking, about pests, uh, about, yeah, like, like all, all this other stuff. I just, I just added as time went as time went by. And one I thing have, that's very important about a contract is that essentially you're not the bad guy and it's the contract. So if anyone says anything like, Hey, can I do this? Blah, blah. It's like, man, I mean, I'd like to, but this is what the contract says, you know? So that's, yeah. Regardless, it's very important to have a contract, but that's one way you can see it. Yeah. All right. And, and then yeah. another question on top of the, of the uh, contracts, how do you guys go with the, uh, let's say you're charging 500 per room. How do you go with the bills? Are you guys including the bills with the fee of the room? Or are you guys doing that, dividing it by, let's say you have four rooms, there's four heads, dividing that by four? Or are mm -hmm. you guys just doing one price for everything? All bills in. So I've done both. Um, in the properties that I lived in, I did, we, we would split it. Um, but then for the properties that like after I move out and had other, other tenants and stuff, I started doing all bills included just because it was a lot easier. So if I were starting from scratch, I would still do it um, all bills included just to make my life easier. But I've done both and both work. Got it. So, uh, yeah. One more one more question. So yeah. if a tenant were to bring in like a guest and the guest were to stay overnight, would you guys charge like an overnight fee for the guest of staying or, or no? No. I mean, on, on the lease, I usually have like 10, like guests can stay for like up to three nights or something like that. And that's it. Would that be with the whole like six month contract or monthly or how would that go? Um, like Sorry, well, like they only have three nights within like the six month contracts or? No, it's three nights a month. Oh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah for sure. And uh, guys, just, I, I know that we're getting to, to the hour here. I, it's here, it's 9, 9 p.m. in Austin, but just wanted to say thank you to everybody. Hopefully you guys did find this helpful. And uh, just, just to let you guys know for anybody that is interested in, what like what Felipe and I have have built with with the mastermind group that we have um just as a plug here with that and Andres who bought his first property he's been part of the mastermind and it's been great we have Julio that's buying his his property soon he's under contract already but we have weekly calls like these we have them weekly we have Q&A we have a Facebook group we have the course with 20 plus videos um, the videos include how to find your investor friendly realtor, your lender, understanding your mortgage payments, expectations when making an offer, explaining the buying process. So all of this stuff, analyzing deals, the questions like the, the ads to find tenants. Um, I tell you like the, exactly all of the steps to find your tenants. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, but we have two calls a week and it is awesome. So, um, that's like what, what, what we do, we're about to open it up to another section in May. Um, and if you guys may not want to be part of the mastermind, but want to do house hacking, just a course, I also have a course on that. I'm happy to share more on that too. 
Um, but we're, yeah. we're, we're also thinking of doing like potentially a, a meetup like we had talked about. So we'll, we'll see about that. We have everyone's emails and we can send uh, over to see who's interested and whatnot. Yeah. So do you guys, did you guys find these helpful? Like, would it be cool if we do like a monthly, monthly house hacking meetup or something? Yeah. That yes. Would be great. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Heck yeah. Okay, cool. We'll, we'll, we'll put it in there. Cause with, with the mastermind, we already have like eight out eight. We have eight calls a month. Um, and we're bringing like freaking amazing guests, <laughs> but, yeah. uh, yeah, I mean, the goal for me is to help as many people possible as possible. Um, just like my mentors have helped me the guys in go abundance and all of that stuff. I just do this to pass the information along and make sure that I help people not make mistakes like I have made. So, um, yeah, if you guys have questions, my at is at Diego Corzo, um, at real Diego Corzo. And then the mastermind, the mastermind is uh, rad race, rad race to fi.com slash mastermind. And I'm putting it in the chat at real Diego Corzo. Cool. Does anybody have any last, last, uh, last questions or anything that they want to share? So for a complete novice to this, um, are there yeah. any books you would recommend to like read or anything else? I know you gave the, the like house hacking, um, class option and everything like that. Yeah. But I'm not in finance at all or like in any kind of business thing. I'm a psychology major and I've been mm -hmm. doing that for like a while but I'm looking to get into like housing. So do you have any intro material that you would recommend? Yeah. So listen to the rookie podcast with BP. Felipe is a co-host on it. Check out that podcast. Um, check out two books set for life by Scott Trench, um, which somebody yeah. just added it here and then get the book. Um, Investing in real estate with bigger pockets is also an amazing book. Get the book. Um, also, the house hacking strategy by Craig. Yo, we can't see it because you'll have the like the green screen. Oh, okay. Sorry. Let me see. And Rich Dad started. Poor Dad is one of the best books as well. That book's amazing. Um, this is the house hacking guide yes. by by Craig. Um, if you guys do go to househackingclub.com, I also have a free guide there. It's like 12 pages on how to get started. And then, of course, you guys can get the course if if you guys want. Um, it's only 97 bucks. So, and it walks you, there's like hours of videos. I give you so much like freaking good content question to ask your lenders question to ask your realtors. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, it's all about the videos. It's all about the content. So check out those books. Um, check out the, um, check out the, the, um, those books, the podcast. And at the end of the day, What's what you what you will see because you're inside in like um the the course that's 97 bucks is my it's my house hacking course um uh, where like that's like what what I was sharing with uh with all of the um uh, with all of the files that I was sharing earlier. Um that's all part of the course. You get like 25 20 videos and the files and all of that stuff. Um but one of the main things for everybody that's starting out, it's super important to connect with like-minded individuals because a lot of people are going to pull you away. They're going to share different things that are not true, not because they, they want to hurt you, but it's because they just don't know. They, are, they will share stuff just because of things that they heard from their coworkers or something. So it's going to be super easy uh, for you to say, no, I'm not ready. Oh, I will wait next year. Um, because a lot of people are afraid of the unknown. So I always tell people you have to connect with like-minded individuals and, um, and connect from, from, and connect with them and share your goals with them and hold yourself accountable. Building a community is super important. One um, thing that helped me out a lot was, uh, the, the rat race FI, which is, uh, Diego's and Felipe's accountability, first of all. And then, like Diego said, like-minded individuals, which was very important for me. And then just going to meetups, meeting people, and um, getting any questions answered from them, from like-minded individuals, like Diego said, it's very important. 
And yeah, bigger pockets podcasts are amazing. Rookie podcasts as one well, reading a lot. Yeah, that would help me out a lot. Yeah, for sure. And if you guys ever need an investor friendly realtor, um, reach out to Andres or I, and we will connect you. I've been part of other mastermind groups, like being part of GoBundance, other connections. Um, I know a lot of people and I'll introduce you to an investor friendly realtor one because that's, that's the agent that, that you want. You want one that has experience, that can run numbers, that will know what's a good deal or, or, or a bad deal. Uh, but yeah, guys, this was awesome. Thank you so much for, for coming. And um, we will be in touch. Again, hit us up on Instagram. And check out Rad Race 2FI if you guys want to learn more about house hacking or the mastermind. We Thank have you. a wait list on the mastermind. It's only 240. The mastermind is 247 a month. Um, and we're gonna be including a Slack coming soon too for like people to ask questions. So it's gonna be awesome. Um, and you guys have access direct to us too, Felipe and I. Um, so yeah, we will be in touch, guys. Have a good night. Take Thank care, you. guys. Thank you guys. Thank you.